Um, that was the first of four uh, sessions on the brain uh, that we're going to have before the break today. Um, Mary Lou Jepson is going to talk about wearable MRI. Nathan Entrator is going to talk about wearable miniaturized EEG. And then Tom Insel is going to talk about using the phone to monitor mental health issues. So um, please allow me to introduce our next wonderful speaker. Uh, Mary Lou Jepson is the founder of Open Water where she is developing wearable optoelectronics opto to detect disease and enable telepathy. This is just one of Mary Lou's bold visions of the future. Um, she invents novel hardware and software systems on the edge of what physics will do. Uh, she's best known for her work at Google X, Facebook, Oculus, and One Laptop Per Child in consumer electronics, computers, TV, VR, wearables, healthcare, and software. Welcome, Mary Lou. Read that. That's right. Thank you, Lisa. This is a terrific conference. I mean, all of these ideas bathing over me. Thank you for inviting me again. I went, I think, in February to the, the one in California, which is a good month to have it in California. So this morning, I couldn't help but think how wonderful it was how many people were cracking open the skull and putting in Utah probes and other probes in your head. And has anybody else had non-optional brain surgery in the audience? I have. I nearly died. I needed to have the brain surgery. And for that reason, of course, you would put the probe in or do the deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's. But I, like Mark from Facebook, who just spoke, um, I think that's not the way to get a billion people into brain-computer interfaces. I think the elective brain surgery is a non-starter. And so I've been working on non-invasive approaches to allow us to image deep into the body in very high resolution. And since I just told you I had brain surgery, there's a stigma when you have brain surgery. You know, are you still smart or not? And it was 22 years ago, and I finished my PhD six months later, and I've founded or co-founded four companies and been an executive at Intel and Google and Facebook. And so anyway, I'm smart. <laughs> and, and, but I, I was, and I've shipped a lot, of, a lot of consumer electronics, really distinguished by its optoelectronics, um, uh, uh, laptops and HDTVs and virtual reality and all the, this kind of stuff. And um, I became fascinated the idea. I do need a clicker, don't I? Oh, here's one. I became fascinated with uh, the idea of lowering the cost of, of something with the functionality of magnetic resonance imaging, or PET, or CT, or one of these multi-million dollar systems that's non-invasive that sits in a hospital where, where the average cost for a scan last year in the US was $2,700, which created $50 billion of revenue in the United States alone, let alone the rest of the world. They're improving about 10% better every three years. They're on a seven-year cycle. 3,000 of them ship a year. And I've been working on figuring out, this has been going on for a while, but I figured out how to do it when I was at Facebook and, and left Facebook before Mark got there, sadly, um, to, to work on this outside of Facebook in my new company called Open Water to reduce the functionality of this into a consumer electronics wearable at a consumer electronics price point. And I was hoping for comparable resolution. But this summer, working around in the lab, we're now at about a billion times the resolution of MRI with an optoelectronic system that just uses LCDs and camera chips and infrared light. So we're astonished. We didn't actually know that was impossible. We're building it up. Again, this is in the lab. But let me talk to you a bit about how it works. Oh, that must be the wrong button. Right. So what do we leverage to do this? The religion of Silicon Valley, Moore's Law, <laughs> double the number of transistors. And why is this giving us this nonlinear impact? And the reason it's giving us this nonlinear impact is because Back to physics, um, the wave-particle duality of light. Light is a wave, or light's uh, a particle, a ray. If you can make uh, feature sizes and detectors small enough to be approximately the wavelength of light, you can detect the wave nature of light. 
which allows you to record diffraction and interference and polarization and a bunch of other four-syllable words. The camera's one thing. If you can do that on the screen, then you can display interference structures and polarization structures and diffractive structures in a way that hasn't been possible to date in consumer electronics. And that has happened with the push that it, I was somewhat responsible for pushing in my, my vaunted position at Facebook where I was running advanced consumer electronics for virtual reality and augmented reality and prior to that at Google with a similar role to create the next generation of high fidelity virtual reality and augmented reality. We have pixel sizes of liquid crystal displays that are approaching the wavelength of light, which means we can interfere light constructively and deconstructively, and that really matters. I'm going to explain to you why. First, as Mark explained, the body is translucent to, to red light and also to near-infrared light. You can't see near-infrared light with your eyes, but if you put on night vision goggles, you could. And near-infrared light goes um, tens of centimeters through your body. So we can get um, your brain and your whole body, unless you're really big, but then you know you could squish your belly <laughs> or something like that if, to get for, for everybody. Um, the light scatters here, and that means you don't get a good image. The reason x-rays and MRI give good images is because the light goes straight through and doesn't get scattered. That's the reason most people using near-infrared light use the so-called ballistic light, the first light through, as Mark, just, Mark Chevalier just explained, the light that goes straight through. 1% of the light doesn't get scattered. You throw away 99% of the light, and it's going super fast. It's going at the speed of light, which is the speed of electrons. So you get shot noise. You get, it's hard to get a good image. So what we want to do is untangle all of that light that's scattering since we can record the wave part of the wavelength of light. And so the key to this is holography. And I don't mean like holography like Tupac on stage in Las Vegas. That is um, literally smoke and mirrors. But instead, holography like the thing that won the Nobel Prize in the early 70s, where in this hologram, this is a piece of film, silver halide film, where we record um, the entire wavefront of all the light that bounced off of or transmitted through that object all at the same time. And then by, by shining a light on the hologram in a certain way, we reconstruct all of the light at all of the angles. Now, if this, if we took a hologram in the infrared of that hand, we could record all of the light that scattered off of that hand or transmitted through of it all of it all at the same time. And then holography has this other property. We can then invert the hologram with a property called phase conjugation and basically make that hand transparent or focus to any spot on that hand, to a millimeter, to a centimeter, to a micron, which is extraordinary when you think, this summer we imaged through four inches of skull and brain to a micron focus using scattering material of skull and brain like a like $100,000 lens. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary that we can do it, but we're doing it with liquid crystal displays and camera chips. And so, of course, the body moves. So you have to recalculate this as the blood is going through, um, things are moving around in your body. So you can't use silver halide. But in the late 80s, not to date myself, I was a graduate student in this building. And with a team of graduate students, we built the world's first fully computer-generated holographic system. And that's my handmade display with uh, one micron pixels. And we used uh, the connection machine to compute the holographic structures in real time. And we made this, this video system. So this is something that it was my first love, holography, and something that um, it's a very niche area of physics, not very popular, very hard to fund, but there, there's, there's a, a nice um, long history uh, of doing this. And what we're doing here is switching the wavelength up to the infrared so we can see through, through the body. And that's possible because of this push for sort of the anti-holography system, the virtual reality system, which is actually 
Microsoft has a product called HoloLens that they use for a marketing term. That's not this kind of holography, just to be clear. That's their marketing term for an augmented reality system, which is pretty cool. Nothing against it, it's just all these definitions everybody's using holography. But the, the one thing that's in common for this push for next generation VR is high fidelity small pixels. And the reason I left Facebook is I thought, wow, we're getting these small pixels. We can do so much, something I thought was so much bigger. But I was part of VR 1.0. So use it in the, VO, in the infrared to see through the body. So here's what's happening. If you ma imagine this big square is like a skull. What we do is we take a hologram of the skull in, in the camera, which sits in line with the holographic LCD. We then invert it, we, we compute the phase conjugate, and then we can focus down to a voxel. A voxel is a 3D pixel. So we can focus, we could actually focus to four points at a time, to three points at a time. And then we can raster scan the whole area. And we can look for the simplest thing to look for is blood changes, which is exactly what a $3 million fMRI system does, functional magnetic resonance imaging. It looks for, for blood changes, because the blood is the blood's red. It's also infrared. It absorbs light. And we just have a single pixel detector, slow detector, right there, same speed as in your camera on your cell phone, but less complex, because um, it doesn't even need to be pixelated. That can look for absorption. We look for scattering changes. For example, when the, the membrane of a neuron roughens, when a voltage goes down, it, it, we create differential scattering that we're recording in our lab. As controversial as that is, we're seeing it. Um, there's also other things that you can look for. Dopamine, epinephrine, um, serotonin have infrared signals, as I was learning just sitting in the audience today from, from Lily from IBM where we can look for where the neurotransmitters are going, and we can look for other features. And as we are able to do this in a wearable, we can layer more structural information on, as it, unlike in an MRI machine, an hour is pretty tough for people. It takes you know, an hour to get a brain scan about. If you want to um, communicate telepathically in an MRI machine, as has been shown by, by many groups over the last five years, you have to spend a lot longer, like 100 hours in that, which is not that pleasant to be in. So if we can put that in the form of the hat and take that big data and layer the information, the structural information on it, we can get even more. So the main point of this is we're replacing, in the lab right now and in products soon, the functionality of a multi-million dollar MRI machine with LCDs and camera chips and infrared light and software at orders of magnitude lower cost in a market that, you know, it's a huge market for MRI. Um, but if it could be wearable and portable and in the doctor's office and in the ambulance and um, in the developing world health clinic or available for people with brain disease, um, a billion of us have debilitating brain disease. It's the most expensive healthcare expense in the world. We could better monitor what's going on and actually um, also deliver therapy. So here's some mock-ups of what we're doing. We don't have a marketing department yet. I call this one ski hat and this one bandage. But it could be a shirt if it's too hard to wrap around yourself. And it's lined. I think this is the first time anybody's made liquid crystal displays that aren't for your eyes. So we're designing liquid crystal displays and camera chips that line the inside of a ski hat or a shirt or a bra for breast cancer detection or things like that. So as fantastic as this might seem, I just want to explain we're leveraging Moore's Law. We hit a discontinuity as we're able to cram those transistors down, thin film transistors, into an, into an area that approaches the wavelength of light. And that's what's enabling this. This is solid physics. It's been known for 50 years by the people that made the first, the first holograms that were of images in the late 60s. The next experiment they did was they put a big piece of ground glass in front of the train set they took a hologram of. And they could image through the ground glass or any kind of diffusing material because the wave nature of light was being recorded. So tools of our time, big data, AI, 
and consumer electronics. And it's a trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure in Asia that makes the LCDs and camera chips in your smartphones. And smartphone consumption, um, everybody has one. And so the sales are going down. And so the manufacturers are hungry for something new. So I mentioned breast cancer. We know MRI gives a better resolution image than mammography, but we don't use it in the United States routinely for detection of breast cancer. We're not thought to be the most efficient healthcare system in the world. I know that's debatable. But no country uses it for routine detection of breast cancer, which kills lots of people. Uh, I think Roz this morning said by 2030, the number one killer of people will be suicide from, from clinical depression. And I had the head, I can't say which country, a very large European country say to me, the moment we have this ski hat ready, he's issuing it to every single patient in the country with clinical depression. People don't kill themselves at rock bottom on depression. They kill themselves when they're coming out of it in a nonlinear, erotic way. And if we could monitor what was happening neurologically, we could keep them safe through their therapy until they get better, for example. This can also help us um, understand and potentially cure other forms of disease. Indeed, infrared therapy is killing, killing removing the amyloid plaques of, of Alzheimer's um, in Europe, where it's approved for usage. And so we're delivering infrared light, too, that could be much targeted and delivered in a better way. So not only read, but, but write with this thing. So also that it, it could be useful for uh, delivering drugs. When people are forced to take drugs, when they are not forced to, asked to take drugs for mental disease, they don't take them because they don't feel well. And so if instead we could make a drug that could just turn on where we delivered infrared light, then we could sort of microdose, but give the right dosage to the part of your body that needed it, or maybe it's your liver or your spleen or, or what have you. So we can, unlike what, what Ed Boyden was showing today, you don't have to drill a hole in the skull and stick down the fiber optic probe to deliver the light. We can just deliver it without all of that, with just an LCD. And then um, telepathy and communicating with thought. Um, this was done with, with a magnetic resonance imaging system about seven years ago at, at UC Berkeley, Jack Gallant's lab. And the, in this experiment, a few graduate students were put in MRI machines for hundreds of hours and forced to watch YouTube videos while recordings of their brain were made reacting to the YouTube videos, so fMRI recordings. And then a new sequence was shown, the presented clip. And the computer, using the scan data alone from the students' brains, guessed what it thought the students were looking at. Seven years ago, it's mighty close. It's grainy, it's mighty close. And I saw that and I thought, whoa, we just have to up the resolution. And, and we're, we're doing that now. But um, the other thing to note is that when you imagine seeing an image versus looking at an image, the same areas in your head light up in fMRI. So that's, again, um, the, bold, the blood signaling that, that Mark just talked about. With, and there's some temporal things for that, for speech. But not for images. You could hold an image for a couple of seconds and then just dump it to the computer, for example. I think it'd be a really cool app. But again, we're, we're focusing down light finer than fMRI and also looking at other signals than just blood. So of course, the next thing is we're not the only things with brains on the planet. And this octopus is never going to get to go to school. But it's super smart, and it's got neurons all over its body. And maybe we could collaborate with it. I mean, we know dogs can smell cancer on us. We know if we could communicate with our dog better, maybe they could you know, fetch us our glasses or a cup of coffee. But it's not the purpose. Um, we know rats can smell landmines. And if we could communicate with animals better, who knows? We might stop eating them and start collaborating with them um, and start thinking, you know, we t there's this thing going on in Silicon Valley about biological intellectual inferiority. And, 
you know, this octopus, who knows, they might be able to figure something out because their structural layout is quite different than ours. So finally, um, this therapy can help uh, Stephen Hawking and people with that kind of disease, but right now, from I think the reason we're all here is we're all a little bit like Stephen Hawking with a very low bandwidth out of our minds. The input's pretty good. The processing seems pretty good. But we have to turn it into either moving our mouths and tongues or typing, essentially. What if we could get the whole thought out before you were interrupted? Or if you're a movie director and woke up with a new idea for a scene or dreamt it, could just dump it to your video, or a musician to get the music out of your head without the incredibly difficult mechanical you know, execution of playing something. So I, I'm very excited about making this new platform and collaborating with many of the people who have discussed other platforms today. And I finished early, too. If there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Sure, she had her hand up first. As You're supposed to use the microphone. I can yell, I think. Um, as a very well-connected and successful female, now that you're an entrepreneur, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing? Oh, now that I'm, so as a very well-connected female something? Professional. Tech, tech. Professional. Now that I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I started my first startup in 1995 with Philip Velda. So this is not, this is my fourth startup. So now that I'm an entrepreneur. I think really my first entrepreneurial thing was falling in love with holography and there being no money and just finding and begging different people all over the world to carve out some small little portion of their budget so that I could work on holography for a few months and move there and move to the house. So I've just done it because I fell in love with this thing and I lived on $800 a month all through my 20s. It's only when I had brain surgery I decided I needed to make money and, and join Philip because he asked me to join this company because um, I really needed health insurance and things like that. But um, I just fell in love with it. But I don't, I, I, I'm try, I don't think I answered your question right. Um, this company, what would you say the biggest challenge you're The biggest challenge I'm facing with this current company right now is just the hours in the day problem. It's, I'm surprised that it's become kind of a hot area. I mean, people really thought I was nuts when I left <laughs> Facebook to start this, and now Facebook's doing it, Elon's doing it, it's become this hot thing. And so we're just trying to move it as fast as we can. And so um, and I'm trying actually not to do what I've done my whole life, which is um, work 16 to 20 hours a day so that I can um, sort of better strategize. So that's the challenge is work all the time or pull back to think about how to work smarter. And I I'm usually do the latter, and I'm trying to do the former, which is strange for me. I'll get over it. Don't worry. I'll be, it won't last. <laughs> Hi. Patty. What's your timeline? What's our timeline? So we gave ourselves the first year to look at the limits of the physics. And then I think what we're going to do probably next year is early access partners um, in a small number of units. Because uh, we don't want to have to support a ton of units. Um, but we want to start debugging and start working on the full system software with, with groups of people. And then um, after that, the really cool thing about working with these very, very sophisticated, I mean, I work with like the Sakai fab at Sharp, it's a $12 billion fab. You make a prototype, it takes two, three months. Then you can make a million of them three months later. And they need you to, because they're living on a really slim, I mean, they went bankrupt. Foxconn bought them, for example, for Sharp. There's a lot of pressure to ship. And so we're trying to line that all up in advance, because then we can be ready to ship. Now, we don't actually have to scale on this project the way you usually have to if you're doing a consumer electronics project. We could start at high end and just say, great, charge us some number of fold more for that subcomponent. But they won't actually like that. And so we're working on, on getting to a high volume application. Or, or really what we're doing right now is figuring out the limits of the physics on five vectors. We're doing sort of like restaurants, the $4 sign product, the $2 sign product, the $1 sign product, and figuring out depth, resolution, scan area, 
and um, the, the volume, the size of the object. And from that, then cranking that through, almost in a McKinsey kind of style, to say, OK, these are the cool areas that we can shoot for, maybe six areas for each, for the $4 configuration, and six areas in the $1 and then configuration, and then decide which one to go for first, because you're not really sure which product will land, and the development cost is expensive for mask sets and to work with a high volume consumer electronics industry. But what it can deliver is, I mean, liquid crystal displays are about $20 a square foot. <laughs> and so you just can't beat it. And silicon is really, silicon chamber chips are about a buck a piece. And so if you think about the cost structure, you know, what can we do to throw that in? Did I answer? Good? That's great. Thank you very much, Okay. Thank you.